Well, we're here with one of my favorite senators, Tom Cotton of Arkansas. Senator Cotton, I'm watching a lot of this coverage, and what's missing from a lot of this coverage, certainly on MSNBC and CNN and in the usual news platforms, is context. Uh, everybody's praising Joe Biden for his speeches, but they don't go back and look at his actions, or should I say inactions. Are you concerned that policies in the United States, which basically reversed all the policies of the Trump administration, help rearm the enemy, help rearm the terrorists, and that uh, we, act, we, we act like none of this actually occurred? Hey, Mark, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, it's a simple fact that not just Joe Biden's policies reverse Donald Trump's policies, but these policies go back to the Obama-Biden era. Um, Barack Obama and Joe Biden have a very ideological view of the Middle East. Their intent has always been to try to elevate Iran as regional power, thinking it can be turned into some kind of normal state uh, that can then balance off against Israel and our Arab partners. When in reality, uh, Iran is a radical theocratic dictatorship and will never be anything but as long as the Ayatollahs govern it. That's why they fund and fuel groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, who are dedicated not just to killing Jews in Israel, but to killing Americans as well. And President Biden's policies are simply a resurrection of Barack Obama's policies, in many cases run by the same people who made Obama or Iran policy in the Obama administration have projected weakness, they have empowered Iran, and therefore they have empowered Iran's proxies like Hamas. And still to this day, even when you look at his speeches, the president yesterday refused to say the word Iran. He talked about any country. He refused to mention Hezbollah. He talked about any organization. Like, he apparently will not even say the names of our enemies for fear of provoking them or angering them. Um, When in reality, what we should be saying directly, not just some unnamed organization or unnamed nation is if Iran or Hezbollah take advantage of the situation, we will crush them as well. Well, he mentioned in passing at the White House, and what he didn't do today is this, Senator Cutton. We focus on this $6 billion, which is bad enough, and it's not just the availability of money at some point to be used for terrorism. It is the fact that we would give $6 billion to an enemy that is trying to build nuclear weapons on ICBMs aimed at the United States, that has sent an assassin to the United States to kill a former Secretary of State, former head of the National Security Council, and a, a, a country that is the, the regime that has killed American soldiers, created horrific casualties. You're a combat veteran. You know this yourself. And we give them $6 billion. Let's pretend they use it to buy flowers. Why would you give them $6 billion for anything? Yeah, uh, and Mark, the argument that Joe Biden and his uh, administration made last month is that, well, it can only be used for humanitarian purposes, food and medicine. Uh, it, it's so dumb that it can only be made in bad faith. Of course, if you give the government of Iran $6 billion dollars, even if you just let them use it for food and medicine, that frees up $6 billion that they would have spent on food mm-hmm. and medicine. And it empowers Iran. And it's not just the $6 billion. It's $10 billion that was rooted through Iraq. It's tens of billions of dollars that Iran has re- reaped because of this administration's refusal to infor- enforce oil sanctions. So, of course, they're using that money to fund and arm their proxies like Hamas and Hezbollah or the militia groups in Iraq that have attacked American forces more than 80 times with barely a response from this administration. And beyond the money, as you say, it also projects weakness. It is appeasement. It tells Iran that the United States will not defend our interests. In fact, will continue to grant concessions in the hope that they turn over a new leaf. And let's talk about something that's uh, concrete to everybody here. So what steps has the Biden administration taken to stop right now, to stop Iran from selling oil to China, Syria, Venezuela, Russia, and anybody else who wants to? Have they, have they said, you know what, we're going we're to change our ways here. We're going to stop the sale, the, the movement of oil. We're going to enforce the sanctions. They haven't said that, have they? No, to my knowledge, Mark, they've taken no steps. And this is, again, central to their appeasement of Iran is to allow them under the table to ship tens of billions of dollars of oil 
to our number one enemy in the world, China. And, of course, that's also a function of their insane energy policy here in the United States. Not only are they trying to appease and conciliate the Ayatollahs, who are unappeasable, but they're also trying to keep the price of gas low at home because they refuse to take action that would produce more American oil. So it's doubly, doubly harmful to America. Are you aware of any Republicans in the United States Senate, or any Republicans, period, that belong to any anti-Semitic organizations? I'm not personally a mark in the Congress or in Arkansas. Maybe there's someone out there. But if any party has a problem with anti-Semitism, it's obviously the Democratic Party. If you look at members of Congress like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, or for that matter, all these radical leftist groups uh, like the Democratic Socialists for America or the Black Lives Matter movement that have been siding with Hamas, siding with people who have beheaded babies, raped and mutilated women and burned families alive for the simple fact that they were Jews. The Democratic Party is the party that has the problem with anti-Semitism in this country. And when Joe Biden says, you know, that anti-Semitism is horrific, you know, he, he made a very good statement about that in front of Jewish groups. But he doesn't call out a single member, Democrat member of the House of Representatives. He doesn't single out a single media organization or single organization, all of which are aligned with the Democrat Party. So when you talk in an amorphous way like Nancy Pelosi did when it came to um, Omar and so forth and so on, talk is cheap, isn't it, Senator? Talk is very cheap. And for Joe Biden, I mean, he's perfectly capable uh, of calling out congressmen and senators by name. He can do that with Tommy Tuberville or he can do it with... um, with Marjorie Taylor Greene, I guess he's never heard of Rashida Tlaib, or he's never heard of Ilhan Omar. Um, but he's perfectly capable of calling out Republicans by name. So maybe he'd call out some of the uh, Democrats in his own party who have been sympathi- sympathizing with Hamas terrorists. Mm-hmm. I don't really see any changes in the Biden administration policy. You know, it's one thing to say we're sending the Gerald Ford, the aircraft carrier, our biggest and most sophisticated, and maybe the Eisenhower will join it. And that's all important. That's all good. Providing the military weaponry that the Israelis need, that's all important, all good. But it's important to figure out how we got here from the Abraham Accords, to the Abraham Accords, which Saudi Arabia almost signed on to, to this. And it's my view, Senator, that unless we get to the bottom of the policies, including in the United States, and hold people accountable, there'll be more of this. Do you agree? Yeah, but- Without a total reversal of the Obama-Biden-Iran policy, you can expect to see more of these savage atrocities because that's what it has fueled with Iran going back to 2013 when President Obama first uh, uh, weakened sanctions and certainly in 2015 when they signed the nuclear agreement. So without a complete reversal of those policies, you will not see peace and stability in the Middle East. Uh, Mark, e- even Jimmy Carter, by the end of 1979, once the Ayatollahs had toppled the Shah and taken American hostage and Soviet Russia had invaded Afghanistan, changed course. He changed his policy towards those countries. He began a small military buildup that Ronald Reagan uh, uh, took and expanded. But even Jimmy Carter changed course. That's exactly what Joe Biden needs to do. Yet I see no indications that he will. He hasn't done a damn thing to reverse a single one of his policies that's funding this regime, that's funding the Palestinian terrorists who had been defunded. You want to defund by Donald Trump in the past. And uh, Donald Trump took out Soleimani. Donald Trump took out Baghdadi. You know, for all the talk about Donald Trump, Donald Trump was not an isolationist. He did believe in peace through strength. I told him that to his face. You're more Reagan than you think with this peace through strength. Step. He put his foot down. I don't see, but Biden says, don't, don't, don't do what? I, I, well, first, first off, there's no question uh, about that. I mean, Donald Trump was willing to enforce Barack Obama's own red lines when he bombed Bashar al-Assad's forces for bashing his own people. That's not a red line Donald Trump wanted to draw, but he knew, like Ronald Reagan knew, that when the president of the United States and when America makes a commitment, if that commitment is not followed through upon, it projects weakness. Killing Qasem Soleimani is exactly what Ronald Reagan would have done. But no, there's no turn from Joe Biden. I mean, look, they, they spent the weekend insisting that 
Well, the $6 billion hasn't been released yet. Not a penny of it has been spent. My response to that is, that's great news. It means that we can freeze it once again. Yet when they're asked about it, they have no answer. They don't give the obvious, sane, common sense answer, which is, of course, we're not going to give Iran $6 billion after their cat's paw, Hamas, has butchered more than 1,000 Israelis, which leads me to believe that they're not going to change course. That they're going to actually go ahead and give Iran six billion dollars, despite the atrocities we have seen in Israel. And my great concern now is when we see when we start seeing Israel, which is a military power, exercise that power to eliminate their enemy, the enemy that wants to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth, and not just in Israel. Uh, that's when the New York Times, which covered up the Holocaust, will kick in. That's when their media will kick in. That's when the Democrats will go wobbly and start talking about, look at the atrocities and so forth and so on that that are being committed by the Israelis. In other words, they'll support the Israelis when they're victims, but they won't support the Israelis to victory, correct? Yeah, that's the the pattern we've seen time and again in the Obama-Biden era, Mark. You saw it in 2006, you saw it in 2008, you saw it in 2012, in 2014, in 2021. After a few days... When there are civilian casualties because Hamas and Hezbollah use human shields at places like hospitals and kindergartens and mosques to attack Israel, Democrats get wobbly and they waver and they start calling for proportionality and restraint. Mark, they cut the heads off babies. There is nothing Israel could do in Gaza that would be disproportionate. And if any child, if any hospital patient, is killed in Gaza, it's because Hamas was using schools and hospitals and mosques for military purposes. And Israel should do now in Gaza and to Hamas what we did after Pearl Harbor, because I think that's the best analogy here is Pearl Harbor. We totally destroyed Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany. Did we keep a head count of how many enemy we killed during the course of World War II, Senator? Uh, there were tens of thousands, Mark. Not in some, on many nights. On many nights. And that I'm, I mean conventional bombing. Not Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but on many nights in places like Tokyo and Dresden, we killed tens of thousands to win that war. And although Israel, no more than you or I, doesn't want to see civilian casualties, in the end, this is war. And civilian casualties result in places like Gaza because Hamas uses them to protect itself and protect its military infrastructure. There are reports now even that Hamas is refusing to allow civilians in Gaza to relocate to what the Israeli Defense Forces are identifying as safe zones because they want civilian casualties. And the American media know it. They 100% know exactly what's going on here. Can we just admit, Senator, the American media is anti-Israel? Isn't that the bottom line, starting with the New York Times? I think large segments of our media are objectively anti-Israel, just like large segments of the Democratic Party. Remember, Mark, on the way out the door at the end of 2016, the Obama administration refused to veto yet another anti-Israel resolution in the United Nations Security Council, something that administrations of both parties had done for decades. Barack Obama openly said that he wanted to have daylight between the United States and Israel, and we saw what that brought us. And you saw with Donald Trump, when there was no daylight between the United States and Israel, what you got. It wasn't an inflamed Arab street. It wasn't rioting. It was peace and stability. Because when America is strong and resolute in the defense of our interests and our friends, our enemies are fearful. And I might add, Senator, that these same terrorists, they can give their groups different names, killed 3,000 American citizens on one morning, killed an enormous number of our soldiers, horrific casualties. You can see it on TV every day what took place here. This is our enemy, too. And we have a wide open border. And I predict, it's not that I'm Nostradamus, it's pretty obvious, that one day we're going to get a horrific hit. People are going to point fingers. 
And we know what the problem is. Senator, I can tell you're playing with your kids. That is wonderful. And I want you to let you go play with your kids. I have a hard break anyway. Well, Mark, thank you. I, I'm, I'm at a Little League ball game tonight, and I, I thought about not accepting the invitation. But I thought, you know, I, I wanted to come on because we're blessed to live in this country and be able to go to Little League ball games yeah. or sleep, even sleep at home safely, not knowing that we have murderous, bloodthirsty savages on our border who would mm-hmm. break into our country, who would massacre our children. And what I am able to do tonight, what all these other parents or children are able to do tonight, is what Israeli parents are not able to do tonight. And that's why we have to stand four square with Israel in this coming war. God bless you, Senator. You're terrific. Take care. Thank you, Mark.